Yo, what's going on, everybody? My name is Jake Thomas, welcoming you to another episode of Sick, Scared, and Stupid. Today we've got another doctor. You guys have been asking for doctors and for proof of concept, and for me not just speaking off my soapbox about this crazy carnivore stuff, but here's another MD, as requested. So this person is actually uh, coming from a space of understanding because she herself suffered for over 25 years being addicted to sugar, processed foods, and was only able to finally relieve herself of that misery once she realized that the true addiction and abstinence was the answer via a carnivore way of life. She's a medical professional, as mentioned before, particularly in the eye world of doctory, and has now been coaching herself for the last 15 years, practitioner of the diet as well, and will be hosting um, some upcoming retreats uh, moving forward with some of her coaching clients, but helping people understand integrative medicine as a form of healing rather as a form of reaction and defense. So without further ado, coming to us from the East Coast, their beautiful beachside estate, Dr. Lisa Wiedemann. Welcome. Yep. Thank you so much, Jake. It's a pleasure to be here. And I am really just so passionate to talk about this because I feel so many people just don't understand that we are exposed to just such a toxic world of toxic food. And this stuff does not belong in our body. I mean, if you were a animal, a human plopped on earth, what would we be eating? It wouldn't be anything that comes in a box, a bag, a bottle, or a jar. And when you start really thinking, why would I put something in my body that is manufactured in a factory, like any sort of corporate food, um, it, it makes no sense. And it makes no sense that that could possibly be healthy. Now, yes, our bodies are very adaptive and can live um, when we put in such toxic foods, but it's a matter of time. I say it's slow suicide. It's mm. just a matter of time before something eventually gradually goes wrong because of the inflammatory aspects of especially seed oils. We can get into that, but you know, sugars and seed oils and grains. I mean, I think people could be so healthy by just really thinking about one ingredient foods. You eat meat, you eat eggs, you can eat fish. Um, I'm not a big fan of vegetables because they've just not really done anything great, nor do I feel that they are of any sort of nutrient density. And I feel that there are so many anti-nutrients and reasons not to put them in our bodies that I'm just so happy going along eating my meat and you know, I, as a kid, and, you know, I, I spoke recently on my YouTube channel with two addiction specialists, Vera Tarman and Bitten Johnson. And it was really interesting to listen how, um, how we are brought up as children in a certain environment, which can trigger certain issues. But, you know, I say my my problems uh, started way back. I was probably about six or seven years old and I got the easy bake oven <laughs> and you could mix up this batter and you slide it into this plastic little oven and a light bulb actually bakes this thing. And uh, next thing you know, I'm on my bicycle da -da 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 -da, riding with my friends to the five and dime store with my, you know, quarters and buying my Pixie sticks and everlasting gobstoppers and Jolly Ranchers and bazooka bubble gum. Green apple was my favorite flavor. And it just went from there that I gradually was getting, unbeknownst to me, of course, I'm just a kid who's now wearing the Husky size at the Sears store and, you know, had weight issues, but didn't know why. But when my mom made lasagna, I always had seconds. And when my mom made mac and cheese, I was so excited. And then, of course, we wonder what's for dessert. And, you know, not that my family's food was that horrible. I mean, we had roast beef on Sunday night with mashed potatoes and carrots, right? But there was other stuff. There was entomans and there was ice cream. And then come into play hungry man TV dinners. Those were good. The peach cobbler dessert that came in with that one was great. 
you're remembering you're some of this me, Jake. I thought back. you were a lot. You're taking me back. I thought you're. I, I'm pretty sure you're a lot younger than I am. But... Kids cuisine TV dinners were definitely were definitely there. Yeah. So you know these things are intentionally made highly addictive by mixing the proper amount of sugar, salt, and fat. And they have addiction specialists right on staff at these all sorts of, you know, you name it, Doritos and um, hamburger helper, everything. And it really um, took a toll as time went on. And I just gradually developed more and more disordered eating because I didn't want to be fat. And, um, you know, I struggled. I struggled for 30 long years until I found, thank goodness for the internet and for my diligence, I just would surf the web at night because this was a rather secretive kind of thing that I was undergoing when I started getting into binging because it's humiliating and I can't understand why I can't stop. And I just hope that I can touch a nerve with maybe some of your listeners who could say, oh my gosh, she's talking my language. Like, yeah to go in the car and eat in the car and throw the wrappers out before you get home or hide the wrappers or wait until people are not home before we dig into something we might have hidden or hoarded. And it's a miserable life. And I could not figure out how to get out from under it. And then come to find out through all my further research with this, that this is actually one of the very most difficult addictions to overcome. Um, You know, alcoholics, you can abstain from alcohol, right? Heroin, cocaine, you you abstain and you don't need it. But food, we have to eat. And the great thing, though, is we don't have to eat carbohydrates and we don't have to eat flour and we don't have to eat sugar. But we do have to live in a world where those triggers are all around us and where emotions and feelings are tied into this and it's family and friends and co-workers who don't understand that I actually have this problem because it was so secretive and you know it wasn't like um, you know people are so quick to say oh you got to try it you only live once what do you mean you're never going to have ice cream the rest of your life well no actually I, I need to abstain from it because it is that highly addictive to a lot of people and yeah abstinence is the way out and Finding the zeroing in on health group that I found back in 2009, 15 years ago, March 9th, I know the date, (laughs) uh, because it was that impactful to me. And I I literally, I I cried when I was in there reading and I saw that there was um, people coming to this for all different reasons, diabetes, arthritis, depression, anxiety, but lo and behold, I'm in there. This is way before Facebook and Instagram, this is just a little, you know, forum of people I happened yeah. upon and we're reading each other's journals and I'm heading in there now. And I'm like, there was a couple women in there talking about how this resolved them of their disordered eating. And I said, okay, this sounds a little crazy, you bunch of meat eaters, but I guess I'm all in. <laughs> so the next day I just said, you know, we, I, I have to give this a try. I, I suffered for so long and it was just life changing. So I'm just, I'm at the point where I, well, 15 years ago, this was bizarre. This whole carnivore thing, nobody talked about it. Nobody, I mean, you knew of Atkins, there was keto, there was paleo, but this full on hardcore zero carb carnivore thing was not out there. Yeah. And so as much as I was excited about it and wanted to help people, because I would come about people like, you know, I my kids were in hockey and soccer and there'd be the moms and some of them were significantly overweight and had a significant issue that I understood. I I knew their language and I just wanted to help everybody and tell everybody. But, you know, people don't really want to be told to throw out all their bread and pasta and rice and cookies and crackers and ice cream and chocolate. Nobody wants to hear that. And nobody wants to believe that pizza could possibly really not be healthy for us. (laughs) Especially in the Northeast. You better be careful. Yeah, (laughs) Pizza and hoagies. 
Oh my gosh. Um, first off for everybody else, uh, Sears is a, it's a former department store. You would go there and purchase clothes. It was a, <laughs> yeah, they had big catalogs. People here, Sears. What is Sears? God, I used Sears to Roebuck. Too. Sears Roebuck. Yeah. yeah, they had um, regular size, slim size, and husky. Husky. Yeah. husky. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you, you talk about the listeners being able to benefit from being able to relate to you talking about BED or binge eating disorder. Well, like, here's one right here. Uh, diagnosed myself, hearing you talk about hiding. The rappers eating or not around people sitting in the car, you know, sneaking the meal, D dumpster diving, done it, you know, yeah, threw I mean, it away. I, you know, I've taken something out of the trash can that I insisted, okay, I'm done. I'm not eating that. Yep, yep. But evidently, evidently the, the real skilled people will um, pour dish soap over it once you throw it out to make sure that you nice. don't after nice. it. I didn't do that because... <laughs> There was always a potential I might need <laughs> to access anyway. that. Yes. Yeah. It's horrible. I, mean, I, I used to have to make sure that I would not just throw the ice cream pints away, but open them, rinse them out, melt the ice cream, and pour it down the sink. Because if I threw the pint away, and let's say I didn't, let's say I threw it away and it was right side up, even if it melted, I'd be like, oh, just put it back in the freezer. It'll refreeze. It'll be fine. Or, or you could take a straw at that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or it's great for cereal. Also, you could just pour that over cereal and it works fine. So no, uh, you know, listeners are going to benefit from it too, but right here is one. I, I can, so much of what you're saying just hit me really hard. And um, what you're talking about with the formulas as far as in how brands, you mentioned a, a few of them, the Frito-Lays, the Yum brands, the Coca-Colas, those products, and for people that don't know this, are literally chemically titrated with droppers to the molecule in order to maintain a flavor profile of the brand, but to be at the limit of what is considered by the FDA to not be labeled an addictive substance. Meaning, okay, Coca-Cola, this is not correct, but for the sake of an easy example, the formula of Coca-Cola is C6H12O5. It is that reason because it meets the flavor profile of the brand but because if it were C6H12O6, it would be labeled addictive by the FDA. So those things are literally, you know, the famous slogans of, I bet you can't just have one, I bet you can't have, just bet you just can't one, have one. One Lay's you know, potato chip. I bet you can't. Pringles, once you pop, uh, you won't stop. I bet you won't. Like they're literally telling you because they have been engineered to ensure that once you pop, you can't stop and that they know, they don't have to bet, they know that you won't just be able to have only one. And yeah, and how about there was there was the uh, the lollipop with the tootsie roll in the center, right? How many licks does it yes. take? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, to get to the chocolate. <laughs> You're bringing me between the 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 hungry man. Uh, the, these commercials, the candies, the bazooka, like you you taking me back. This is good. This is great stuff. All things I relate to very much. And um you know, it is difficult because like you said about drugs or alcohol, for example, like, yeah, been there, done that too, and, and recovered from those things and still recover from those things. But you can live without them. Like you said, with food, it's, it's a requirement. You know, it's and also, it's also people understand if you are a recovered alcoholic and everybody knows that, because when that kind of thing happens, people know you were an yes. alcoholic. Now you abstain, right? Nobody walks up to you at a party and says, you just got to try this Cabernet. I just <laughs> got from the local winery. It's incredible. Right. I mean, come on. You only live once, right? Or, right, right. or, But it happens all the time with food. And people don't understand because I'm, I'm sure a lot of people listening are like, oh, this lady is crazy. You don't, you're not actually addicted to it. And you don't actually have to abstain completely from it. Oh, yes, yes, I do. I do no not idea. even put fruit in my mouth because any taste of sweet triggers cravings and it triggers things in my brain, maybe not in yours or maybe not to the same degree in yours, because I really do believe there's a spectrum of this. Mm -hmm. And I think people who are listening can start thinking to themselves like, yeah, I couldn't live without chocolate. Like just that saying doesn't mean you're binging on an entire box of chocolate every day, but... The thought to you, if I said, 
Sugar is inflammatory. Sugar feeds cancer. Sugar is rather toxic to our bodies. We can only handle a very small amount in our blood and then our body has to work hard to get rid of it. Why are we putting it in our mouth? And how about you abstain? Why don't you try for 90 days? That means no barbecue sauce. I mean, I could if I wanted to. I could if I wanted to. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. That exactly, yeah. That that's a very common reply. Like, well, why would I have to? I but see, and and maybe they do moderate, and maybe yeah. they're the kind of person that can have one chocolate, dark chocolate covered pretzel. <laughs> there's no such thing as having one no, of those. No, there's okay? not. No, no, there's maybe one package. Yeah, one, of them, one, carton, but, one entire carton worth. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I mean, but I, I really like to talk about this because even if there, if I can help one person out of the hell hole I was in yeah. and one person to understand that this is truly, it's, it's not your fault and it's not something that you did. It is, it's happened in your brain and you could uh, watch Fit and Johnson has some great presentations over on YouTube, and you can see brain scans of somebody on cocaine and somebody on sugar, and it's actually lit up a touch more on the sugar one than the cocaine one, the centers that fire up from addicted substances. And it it really is important for people to understand that if you are struggling with this, and unfortunately, like I said, the slow suicide is most people say, oh, I'm fine. I'm yeah. fine. I don't, I'm not on any medication. No. Well, how about another five or 10 years of putting that toxin in your body? How long is your body going to fight it off? Or yeah. are you starting to develop thyroid issues or arthritis or anxiety or depression or skin issues or blood sugar issues? Or at what point do you all of a sudden, oh my God, you get a diagnosis of cancer. Now what, what caused that? I don't know, maybe 10, 20, 30 years of eating grains and sugar and processed foods. And maybe we should really think about the fact that we should stop and we shouldn't put anything in our body that comes in a box, a bag, a bottle or a jar. And everybody, I say that because I think it's just kind of a cool thing to say because it's yes. making an impression that, yeah, you know, animals, eggs, then everybody says, well, but meat yeah, comes course. in a but you know, like of course. my burgers come in a box. All right, come on. <laughs> let me have my little saying. <laughs> no, I, I'm I'm with you. I, I say the same thing, like box package wrapper. You know, it have if yeah, it or anything me, that's got more than one ingredient on it. Really, yeah, if it has to tell me what it is and all the things that it doesn't have in it and all the things that it's not, I'm like, mm, that's a lot. As opposed to like ingredient meat, <laughs> yeah, contains Egg. or, organic eggs. You know, yeah simple and straightforward. And like what you're talking about with, you know, other people around and the parents uh, of, of your kids at the games and the hockey games and the baseball games and everything. And what makes it so difficult is that, you know, eating is as much of it is an individual sport. It's a team sport too. It is communal. Oh, yeah. It is familial. It's, it is celebratory. We mourn together to eat. We celebrate. We have birthdays. Yeah. We have funerals. We have weddings. We're on vacation. Whatever, this, whatever we're doing, we're sharing yeah. that experience. This is what you I know? say. It's, how quickly does any conversation get to where are we going? What are you bringing? What are we having? Absolutely. It's like food is central and I get it. It's part of traditions. It's part of holidays, but it has become invasively part of everything. Like, you know, even your kid's soccer game. Oh, who's bringing the orange slices? Who's bringing the Gatorade? Oh, I cringe yeah. at all the crap food. And the granola bars, it's just sugar. It's all yeah. sugar. It's so bad. And uh, it's, it, you know, just we could cringe at what has happened. And that's that's why I feel like it's so and this information is not really getting out there unless we do this grassroots. You, Jake, with your podcast and me trying to shout it from the rooftops and help people with my coaching groups and on yeah. my YouTube channel. I'm just so emphatic about people understanding. I don't, you know, here's, here's one of the tough things with this whole, I just call it sugar slash carb slash processed food addiction. Cause I feel like it's a spectrum and 
once you're eating this stuff, you're drawn to continue eating it. Pizza, grilled cheese sandwiches. I mean, who doesn't like all this stuff, I mean, that's, right? That's childhood 101. When I, yeah, to this that's day, when I think about when I'm sick or if I'm sick, I'm thinking Campbell's chicken noodle or chicken rice and stars, uh, yellow Gatorade. I actually Sprite. like the cream of mushroom too. <laughs> <laughs> well, that or cream of tomato with the uh, grilled cheese. And it's like at a yellow Gatorade. And by the way, it's yellow Gatorade, not whatever the flavor of it's called. Somebody asked me that the other day. They're like, do you call Gatorades the colors or the flavors? I was like, they have flavors? I only know them as the, as the colors, <laughs> you know, like red and yellow. Blue, red, yellow, right. Yeah, I don't know the names. You know, I just call it by the color. But but yeah, that's uh, that's what I think of too. It's, it's just embedded you know, in our subconscious that, that gets embedded into our conscious, right? Like from an early age, from the onset of, of childhood, that's what we begin, like you said, early suicide, essentially, it's just that we're, 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 we're poisoned and it's not our faults because we're so impressionable and so fragile and so exposed then that it becomes part of us. It, it pushes away the innate, you know, desires or the innate attractions, I think, that we're born with. And Yeah, and then it, here's, here's the the real big second component to this that we really haven't brought up yet that I feel is so instrumental in understanding how to recover from the situation and get healthy and stay healthy. Cause I have a lot of people say, yeah, I can stick with carnivore for two weeks or two months. And then I am in the ditch. Well, Guess what that is? It's that ditch demon up there who's rooting you on. Come on, don't offend your host. Of course, you're going to have some garlic bread with everybody because you don't want to yeah, yeah. hurt anybody's feeling, right? So there, there, there's all that, right? But the 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 big aspect of this is that just like you were saying from early childhood and as we go through life, we deal with stress. We deal with, we call it sometimes an emotional void. What are we filling that with? Often it's food. And we're turning to food for all the reasons other than hunger. And we're turning to food, whether we feel depressed, lonely, angry, anxious, stressed, bored, 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 bored. procrastinating, or even happiness even when you're with friends and it's like let's dig into the chips and guacamole and oh look we got seven layer dip over here and whoa look who made the chocolate mousse that we're having later and it's all food and you get this thought process where that's where a lot of times you find your comfort and your joy and even though a lot of times it ends up just being lonely on the couch with a bag of chips and a box of cookies and a container of ice cream and some corn muffins and <laughs> you, and cereal. Have you been watching me, Lisa? <laughs> <laughs> I've got my little drone out, but it's it's really interesting that how how we learn to turn to food, and yeah. I'll just take tell t- talk on as an aside on. Um, what I have, because here's the thing, Jake, I have found through all these 15 plus years of being carnivore and living an amazing change of life by understanding that meat is the most nutrient dense. I eat meat, I eat eggs, a little bit of seafood mixed in here or there. Um, but it has come to my realization over time is that I still turn to food for emotional reasons and it's an emotional vent or entertainment that we do these things. And it's really bad because I learned how to fry cheese. Cheese is carnivore. I learned how to put sharp cheddar on a plate of pork rinds and microwave it for a few seconds and have my own version of my old binge food of, you know, nachos grande. Right. And I can overeat meat too. I make a huge package of one pound package of bacon. Guess what this girl can do? She can eat the whole damn package. (laughs) 
Why? Because I have these tendencies from my background to overeat. I don't, you know, you can call it a, a fullness disorder too, that, um, or just the fact that it looks good. It smells good. I can picture the crunch of that bacon and it's on the counter. Okay. Lisa, wrap it up and put the rest in the fridge for leftovers. Mm, yeah. Doesn't usually make it to the fridge. And then people say, well, just make two or three slices and have it with your eggs. Yeah. You know what? I make them and they're so tiny. I'm like, I got to make at least a half a package, yeah. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm just really understanding. And I love this term, even if it's healthy food, carnivore food, if I don't have sober behavior with it, it cannot be in my space. I can have bacon when I go out and get a bacon cheddar burger, bunless, of course, but there's portion control there because they're only going to put two or three pieces on there. But right. if I make a pound of bacon, that's just, um, it's, it's gone, right? Yeah. And the, the cheese does not do well for my waistline. And I have learned how to pretty much fry any type of cheese. And it's amazing. It's, a, it's really incredible what you can do with cheese. Yeah, <laughs> and it goes into some really great recipes. And it, it really gives me as a long time disordered eater <sighs> stress and I don't have peace around the food. And now where am I at? I want peace yeah. around the food. So, you know, with, with my groups now, we're doing these fun sardine challenges where we're eating nothing but canned sardines for two or three days or nice. 10 days. I'm doing it 10 days into KetoCon. So Jake, nice. when I see you there, if I look like a little pilchard, because <laughs> <laughs> I'm only eating sardine, but it's incredibly you interesting. Awesome. It's, it's, it's an experience. I, it, it lowers your glucose. It raises your ketones. You drop weight and you get to yep. eat. Yep. And in the most incredible way, it has taught me because I don't like sardines, never ate them my whole life. I think they're gross. I open the tin and I'm grossed out. I got to break them up. It's not fun. Yep. Yep. I have learned what true hunger is because Absolutely. when I enter into the challenge and I know what is in store for me when I decide to eat one, two, three tins, I only choke one down <laughs> once. And it's very satiating. It's incredible. Mm. But when the hunger comes again, I'm like, am I hungry? No, not so much. <laughs> so we coined this term sardine hunger. So in normal day to day life, I really do think long and hard, like, Am I eating for entertainment? Am I really ready for a meal? Would I eat a can of sardines right now if it was the only thing on yep. on on the menu? Mm. Yep. So it's it's just really interesting. I know I'm just kind of going on this tangent, but no, it's great. It's great. <laughs> I saw I saw Courtney talking about the the sardine challenge, so that's that's really cool. Um, yeah. So yeah, she came on my YouTube. Um, Monday night, because she's also in my group. And nice. we had three of us talking about this because it does incredible for for weight loss. It's absolutely it's crazy. We call them these magical fishies. And it's just <laughs> something interesting. And then we get all these comments, people like puke, I'd, I'm going to do a water fast before I would ever put one of those in my <laughs> mouth. And I'm like, yeah, I thought the same thing too. But have an open yeah. mind. Yeah. And, and, and try it. It really doesn't take taste much different than tuna. So no, that's not that bad. I'm a, yeah. I'm a very big advocate for mono eating, um, in intervals, you know, like weeks of this, 30 days of this and that, um, because a hundred percent, it teaches you about what real hunger is as opposed to desire. Exactly. 99% of people in the first world, nine, I'd say 99% of people have never actually been hungry, wanted to eat really bad. Yeah. Well, maybe not 99. But I would say the overwhelming majority, I'd say plus 90% of people have never actually been hungry. Have they really wanted to eat? Sure. Have they felt like they needed to eat? Sure. But were they actually by definition hungry? I bet so not. Were they starving to their own words? Definitely not. Because yeah. 
if I were to offer those people, I said, all right, here you go. Here's a uh, uncooked, dry head of cauliflower. Go for it. You said you're starving. I'm not eating that. You're not hungry then. Or here's your here's your raw can of sardines, you know, or fish can of sardines. Cod, open cod, it up. Go for it. Yeah. I'm not that so hungry. It's interesting when, yeah, you say the, the mono meal. People, people who have in their past a little history of binging, overeating, they typically do really well when you tell them, this is what you can eat. And when you're hungry, you eat it. And when you're hungry yeah. again, you eat it again, whether it's ground beef yeah. or whatever it is, right? So I, in, in my group, I call it, um, we have a couple names, meal on repeat, MOR. What's your MOR? Are you doing nice. an MOR? It works incredibly well because you can figure out your macros. You can figure out what combination feels good, how much fat feels good. If you need 70-30 yep. or if you're good on 60-40, you can figure that out and put that MOR, meal on repeat. Or I, I also call it the RMM, repetitive meal method. Love and that. it can really reset somebody who's been off the rails in the ditch having issues with food it's like all right and it's not meant to be punishment it's not meant to be torturous because it's really not when you're hungry you get to eat yeah. the sardine thing can be a little bit torturous if you're not a fan <laughs> of them especially if you open the can that has the tail still on it that's like <laughs> Ah, oh, take a deep breath, Lisa. It's good perspective. It's real Pull perspective. Pull up your big girl panties. Here we go. <laughs> Put the hot sauce on. That's the saving grace. <laughs> I've, I've done similar things. Like I call it either mono mealing or just mono eating when, uh, especially traveling. Um, if I'm at a hotel, I don't have the proper uh, equipment to cook my own food. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I eat, ton I eat tons of food raw anyway. But one of my favorite mono meals, especially while traveling, is just half a pound of beef liver, half and half a pound of butter. Literally, just eating sticks of butter or just right out the tub. Like if I'm in New York, just get some fresh Ronnie Brook from the stores up up northeast in the northeast with a bunch of veal liver and love eating that. And people are like, God, do you really want to eat that? Like it's tasteful and you're craving it? I'm like, no, but that's why I go to it. Food like right. this, you're never craving it. You know, something right. that you crave, that you lust for, you're drawn to through addiction, through desire. You do right. not, I don't know anybody that lusts for a can of sardines. Do you like them? Sure. But you're never going to be like, oh my God, I can't get enough of these things. And I'm just going to power there's, my way through them like yeah, a bag of Jolly a, Ranchers. There's a few people that chime in under the, the videos and say, I love sardines. I've eaten them since I was a kid and my mom's from Sardinia and that's where the sardines came from. I was like, oh, great. Well, you know what? Actually, this challenge is not going to work so well for you then. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, outlier. <laughs> Listen here. This is for people who really are kind of like gagged by them Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because we tend to really eat to satiety <laughs> yep. and eat when we're really sardine hungry. But yep. it, it is really interesting. So are you eating the liver raw? Mm -hmm. I don't I actually don't like cooked liver um, or I haven't had it in a while, so I shouldn't say I don't like it, but I, I much prefer liver raw. That said, mm -hmm. I'm not going to eat like five pounds of raw liver. You know, I could eat five pounds of beef, like, I mean, not five, but I've tried, yeah. but I've gotten up almost to five before in a sitting and I could do that, you know, enjoying it, loving it lustfully. Right. But five pounds of liver like i'd be like this is this is not gonna be my favorite thing in the world to do yeah but that's why i choose that as my mono meal because it's yeah. something that i have to be very present for something that i have to take my time with because there's a lot of indecisiveness do indecisiveness do i like this am i actually enjoying this oh that's pretty good this is interesting it's not so just mindless it's very mindful because i'm tiptoeing around it because i again do i like this I'm, i don't know but it's taking away that just massive rush of dopamine and pleasure and turning it into purpose and utility. That's right. not to I mean, say that I don't enjoy the meal and that I shouldn't be enjoying the meal. I am, but it shouldn't be so overrun. Are you really pleasure. enjoying the raw liver though, Jake? Are you really? Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Like, like I said, is it dominant in pleasure? Definitely not. It's can much I ask more dominant. You, can I ask you this? Uh, so you're, let's say, traveling and you've gone and picked up some raw liver and um, are you putting salt on it? Just salt. Just salt. 
So now here's a very interesting thing that I have really looked into a bit uh, because there's a lot of long-term carnivores who do not salt their meat. They don't salt their food. And I was like, huh, that's weird. I just salt to taste and yep. blah, 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 right? Well, here's a very interesting aspect to salt. One, I have looked into it. There is an addictive quality to salt. And they've done studies and people who are eating, let's just say it's something as simple as a salted um, bit of ground beef or a steak versus people eating unsalted. There's an 11% increase in the volume of food that the salted people eat, which you might say, well, that's only 11%. Well, you know what? That converts to that an overweight person compared to a normal weight person. Okay. So I start, so I did an experiment with the lion diet where I was just out of curiosity. I did an unsalted experiment with it. And it was incredible how I thought going into it, ugh, why are you making yourself miserable? This is crazy. You're going to be dying for the salt shaker. I really actually learn to embrace the flavor of the meat and meat does have sodium in it. So it's not like you're, you're not going to um, put yourself into ill health. What are you doing? You have to have salt. You need right. salt to live. Well, there is naturally occurring salt in meat and seafood and eggs. Right. So, um, but it was really interesting because I know, and picture this, let's say I make three pounds of ground beef because I'm making extra for future meals. I don't want to cook all the time. And I put taco seasoning on it, mm. or even let's just say salt. If I eat a pound, which I can easily do, if I'm packing that up, I would, you know, pick, if it's not salted, I might not even finish the pound and I am not picking at any more as I'm wrapping it up because it's just, I don't want to say bland, but plain meat. There's a there's another level of tantalizing our tongue on the salt receptors that is different. And I'm just, I'm just throwing this out there because it's really been an interesting experiment for me. And it's not something that I plan on doing forever or going forward with like, oh, great, Lisa, now you can't even salt your damn meat because you're going <laughs> to binge on meat. Great. Where are we at here? Um, I'm just throwing these out that as very interesting kind of um, just thoughts that are, um, you know, for, for different reasons based on where, where you're at, but I could, yeah, I, that's why I was really curious if you salted the liver, uh, because I'm thinking I've, I've actually only tried once a piece of raw and it was beef liver. Um, but mm, that's a rough one. <laughs> Te text texturally or taste for you? Both. Yeah. Yeah. But interesting, I've opened up a tin of cod livers and I thought, yeah. oh man, this is going to be nasty as all hell. No, it's good too. It's so good. Yeah. The texture is almost like mousse. I don't know. Custard. It's weird. It's custard. It's like custard. custard. Yeah. Flan. Yeah, like flan. <laughs> yeah. It's like flan <laughs> without the sugar. Yeah. But it has no overbearing, strong liver taste at all. It's, it's very interesting. And then you mix that with a little scrambled eggs. It's actually really quite delicious. Mm -hmm. I had some <laughs> on, on top of a burger uh, a few weeks ago. It was freaking awesome. Uh, this is so funny about the salt. You're the third person in a week now to bring this up to me. I, really? I had an interview, interview with Dr. Chafee like about a week ago, then Bella Ma like three or four days ago, both talking about limited salt or no salt and like how here you are bringing it up i'm like okay like here's another rabbit hole i'm about to go down you know but yeah or, or just, yeah just just think about like hmm maybe i'm gonna go a little lighter on salting and see what it's like but i just say even i've just through that experiment even just making burger patties it's like damn they're really pretty darn good with yeah. no salt and I, honestly, I thought I was going to be going a little bit crazy thinking, oh, just dying for salt, but it wasn't the case. It was really interesting. More so, more so was it like the fact that we're just, our taste buds are, um, you know, they're, they're, I don't want to say damaged, but they're just they're so accustomed. used to, they're so accustomed, right? Yeah. And then when you remove that stimulus, they revert back to 
normal uh, t tolerances or, or tastes, so to speak, to where like you taste it and you go, wow, this is actually pretty good after, it probably took a few days maybe to curb that or was it immediate? It was pretty, um, I'm gonna say within the first one to two days, it was not an issue whatsoever. And it so quickly flip-flopped to even the opposite where I started thinking, I don't want to ruin this ribeye with the salt. <laughs> like having that salt flavor, I was starting to love, man, I'm biting, you know, taking a bite of the ribeye cap okay. and I am just loving the flavor of, I, I don't know, maybe. Okay. It's your a, your experience might on. be different. <laughs> no, it's on. Um, you got me. Like I said, three people in a week talking about. I'm like, God damn it! Like now, I gotta, <laughs> gotta try it. You know, like I gotta try it. Yeah, and like really, I mean, th there really is no specific reason to, um, you know, if I always say, you know what, if you're if you're healthy, on no meds, no diagnosis, at a good metabolic lean weight. You don't have to change anything, you know, no. I feel like we naturally are just because then people will argue, well, there's salt licks out there. And I know those animals are going to that salt lick. Like there's yeah. always the naysayer of why, of you know, because I'm like, you know, we're not in general, would we as humans, animals on earth and hunting to get our food, where's the salt shaker? Of course. Right. And are we near a quarry or a salt mine or are we near the ocean? Like right. how imperative or necessary is it to, you know, our health? But we can also I did not read this book, but Dr. James D. Nicol Antonio wrote The Salt Fix, Ooh. and it's an entire book about the importance of salt and salt and salt and salt. Oh, and right, that's right. That's right. So I didn't read it. Uh, I actually wanted to finish my no salt lion tide experiment before I had anything that <laughs> jaded me into grabbing the salt shaker again. Sure, but sure. evidently people have told me like, Oh, you got to read it. No, you got to have salt. <laughs> and, you know, there's a lot to be said though, too. Um, there's Dr. Angela Stanton, S-T-A-N-T-O-N -T -T is a specialist in migraines and how there's a very uh, specific protocol, which includes salt. And, you know, there, so there's there's all different aspects of it. And I'm sure you and I could both go down a lot of rabbit holes with it, trying to figure out what we should or shouldn't, because don't you find like, you know what, when you come into this space of realizing we have been so blindfolded from, you know, we're, we're not being told the truth. And I say, well, now I just do the opposite. They tell me, oh, you got to put sunscreen on. I wouldn't touch that stuff. <laughs> it's toxic. It causes Sorry. cancer, right? It's like all this stuff. And, oh, make sure you stay out of the sun in midday and you wear a hat and you wear long sleeves. I'm like, I'm like no, 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 no. To the sky wide open if I can. Yeah. And I'm probably one of the very, very, very few eye doctors that will recommend for the most part, most times do not wear sunglasses. Ah, you're kidding me. My doctor told me my, oh, you've got to wear sunglasses, cataracts, <laughs> macular degeneration. I'm like, no, 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 no. You know what? Our eyes are so much more than an organ for vision. There are so many receptors in there that need the signal from the sun and you're much more likely to get sunburn when you're wearing sunglasses because you're telling your body that it is nighttime dark. and we don't have to worry about the sun because we are in dark and there's there's just and then with circadian rhythm and hormones and there's so many different aspects of why you want sunlight to enter your eyes and be on your skin and you know, that's a whole nother, you know, discussion for another day. <laughs> <laughs> God, no, yep. Uh, I'm going to have to try the, the no salt thing. I mean, my, my main concern would be, you know, or not concern because kind of like what you're touching on about things you find on this journey, um, of, of eating this way, the physical benefits I say are byproducts and indirect, obviously they're directly related. I know that, but it's the mental 
level ups that you go through, these breakthroughs, these eureka moments, these ahas of, of, of introspection, that because when you remove all these variables, which are distractions in the form of pleasure, and of course, the ones that are chemically constructed distractions to keep us, and for the namesake of the podcast, sick, scared, and stupid, literally, when you finally liberate yourself from that and start to feel the way a real human being is made to feel, to see the way we're made to see, hear, understand, listen, be, a, be in touch with the world and with yourself around you, in touch with yourself and the world around you, the way we're supposed to be like, you're not superhuman. I am not super. This is human at level, at base, the way we're supposed to be. Everybody else is at deficit. The way they're feeling, thinking like an, us being told like, yeah, we're trying to find like superhuman strength and like live in outer, you know, outer bodies. And no, this is status quo of a human being. Everybody else is just in this deficit with a parachute behind their back or a weight vest on and thinking that it's normal life. It's not. And so getting there takes these little challenges like a lion diet with no salt. Like you find things about yourself. Yes, you understand the experience and you get a new relationship with food and flavor and, and profiles of understanding what textures feel like. When I started eating raw food, that was a huge one for me because every bite was, in, was I was inquisitive, I was uncertain, I was afraid. Do I like this? I don't know. Is this wrong? Am I going to die? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Because so much of it was new. All of it, for the most part, was new. As opposed to, yeah, we sit down in a steakhouse. We have 90% of that meal already done in our subconscious mind through memory and recollection. We know what the texture is pretty much going to be like, the flavor profile. Okay, it was charred this way. I got that too. They use this kind of salt, this kind of butter. All right, like I have 90% of it in here. Now, the experience of us at the restaurant or we're together at your, at your beach house, we're cooking steaks out on the grill outside on the balcony. It's amazing. But for the most part, I got 90% of that in here in my mind. Whereas opposed to we do this raw every bite. I'm like, Oh my God, am I sure about this? And like every chew, every because sensation. It's all, it's all that fear mongering that totally. you have to cook it to 160 and the warnings on <laughs> the menus. And I actually, I, I didn't, I didn't know your, your, rawness background or whatever. <laughs> I'm not even sure how much or what you do, but I love eating raw meat and beef tatar I make. Oh, yeah. um, and I actually, when I make a burger, it is literally raw inside. I just sear it for a couple seconds on the outside or, and, and people like, you can't do that with ground beef. Don't you know the E. coli? <laughs> and it's like, well, really? I've been doing it for 15 years and I'm still fine. And I, I made some beef tartare at Whole Foods in Tribeca with some friends of mine a few months ago. We were shopping to get food and I was picking up liver, picking up the butter. And I was like, you guys want some beef tartare? And they're like, what? I was like, yeah, watch, we'll make it upstairs in the, in the, the dining area. And they're like, dude, you gotta be kidding me. And I bought some bone marrow and we, I nuked the bone marrow in the microwave. They're like, dude, seriously, you're like, you're not gonna, I'm like, you see a freaking oven here? Like we can't roast it. Like you're not gonna die from this, what you think is radiation exposure. Like, don't worry. Those uh, AirPods are doing a lot worse for you than this microwave. But we made tartare and Whole Foods in the dining hall in Tribeca. And they were like, you know, I dropped an egg on top. And they're like, I was going to say, did you even do the yolk? <laughs> yeah, I was like, yoked it, yoked it in the in the ground to, to, to get it all together and then put another one on top to, to bust it open uh, as we ate it. And they're like, dude, I can't disassociate what my what my eyes are seeing with what my mouth is telling me. It's because so my good. eyes are telling me this is wrong and disgusting. And, and gross impossible and gross but my mouth is telling me this is amazing yep exactly yeah i i love it i actually have a a youtube video on raw beef and i put my favorite beef tatar recipe because every restaurant i would ever go to if they had it i ordered it and i became yes. like a little critic of the different variations of, you know, the cornichons, the capers, the this, the that, you know, and I just came up with my absolute favorite recipe, a little Dijon, a little pickle yep. juice, a little, you know, and oh, I bind it with just raw yolks. Yep. And it's just incredible. And I have fun. Well, so at each of my carnivore beach retreats I'm hosting here, most people are totally grossed out by the thought of raw meat because 
they're told all their life, you got to cook it properly, you know, and, um, but yeah, I'm going to make it and have people be exposed to the fact that I really think that there is another level of nutrient benefit eating raw versus cooked. Certainly not well done. <laughs> Can't even imagine that people would ruin their meat doing that. But um, it was it's interesting. I don't know if you know, on Instagram, there's a guy called Raw Meat Experiment. And oh, yeah, Joe. Yeah, he's South, South Florida guy. Yeah. Yeah. And he was eating and That's then John, John and yeah. then he was um, raw chicken. Then he chained and made the yeah. raw chicken account. He had like, I think a half a million followers on oh, it yeah. every day for a hundred days was just eating raw, raw chicken. chicken <laughs> even, and yeah, it, it was, it was great because, yeah. well, and of course he, he sourced the chicken from, a actual chicken farm. It wasn't like yep. Walmart, you know, packaged yep. chicken, but still let's just, you know, he, he had such brilliant um, commentary on each of those. I don't know how much he followed it, oh, but it, yeah. I, like when he's it talking was about so, it, so to... entertaining. I was disappointed when the hundredth day got there, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he would put it in the blender with, um, yeah. you know, making all bacon sorts ranch, of stuff. Uh, bacon ranch club, yeah. or chicken yeah. and waffles or, eating raw chicken every day until I get a tummy ache and talking yes. about it. I'm trying, and I'm trying to get this salmon vanilla, but I just can't get it. Can't quite get the salmon vanilla to hit me. Yeah, he's yeah. just amazing. I loved it. In the and, you know, and, and I love the way he would write and say, what makes us think that we are the only, the only animal that cooks their cooks food? food. Yeah. Only one. Yeah. What makes us think that it's not healthy for us? that we, after the invention of fire, all of a sudden had to cook our meat, right? Yep. So it's it's just really interesting. And I, I get it. A lot of it is how are we sourcing it? I, I don't want to get from, you know, Cargill and all these, the big meat pack no, places Tyson. and, no, you know, the CAFO and all that, you know, the I, I get it. And yep. ideally I'm going to source all my meat from regenerative farm and do all that. But the average person can't afford it nor has the, um, you know, a lot of people are busy, family of five, they're, you know, they're yeah. running to Costco, they're getting meat on sale. And that's what I did for 15 years. I really, I just shopped, Porterhouse was on sale. I got eight of them. Limit two, I go in the store four times. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the truth though. Like, and for people thinking that it's expensive, like, look, you can cure your obesity, you can reverse your diabetes, you can cure your eczema and psoriasis with freaking hot dogs and bologna. Now, and you have be no a... reason to purchase medications, pay no. co-pays. Nope. I nope. feel I have no reason to, I have no use for the medical system. And I actually recently canceled my health insurance. And um, because I have been paying almost $700 a month for the past five years, mm -hmm. um, like just solo on my own because I wasn't working a full-time job. And I'm like, I have not gone to the doctor once. What am I doing? So yeah. I am switching over to like crowd health. It's basically a, you know, health care, not health insurance. And it's, you know, it, it's a whole different thing, but I just want to get out of this whole system. And actually that company crowd health is um, going to formulate a subset of people with a lower monthly rate if you're keto or carnivore. Nice. So how cool would that be, right? Freaking awesome. I love that. Like, yeah. So, you know, dating back 25 years, dealing with your own issues, working through your professional career as an optometrist for the last 32 years. And then when, when did you really get into this passion for trying to educate patients on reversing diabetes or, you know, halting progression of their, their macular degeneration and, um, and then into actually formally coaching, you know, outside of, uh, your practice. Yeah, that's, that's really, this is such a, well, partly sad, but interesting way that our healthcare system is. I, as, as more time went on, like, and I started, people would start writing to me. I, turned to carnivore to, re, you know, to resolve my diabetes, but oh my gosh, my dry eye went away. And oh my gosh, yeah. I even have somebody whose retinitis pigmentosa is improving. And 
there's all this stuff. And, and then I was hearing and seeing all the reversal of the diabetes and all this stuff. So I could no longer practice and have a patient in my chair. I couldn't bite my tongue. I, even though it's not the standard of care to talk about this and do this. So mm. we can get in trouble for doing this and for spending time trying to educate people about how they can reverse this disease process and get off their medications. And so there, there's, there's that aspect of it that it was, it became difficult and I actually had to leave my position because I would not um, fall in line of what I was supposed to do. Um, but the other really interesting thing, Jake, this was, Kind of, it's a little bit heartbreaking, but it just plays into my thought of how addictive this food is. I would have a patient in my chair, diabetic, and I'd show them right on the computer screen on my desk next to them. All right, here's the picture I just took of the inside of your eye. Do you see these spots of blood? This is called dot and blot hemorrhaging, and you have the early stage of diabetic retinopathy, and you can lose your vision. You can go blind from this. This is really important. Now, what I'm supposed to say, this is really important that you go to your diabetes doctor and talk to them about controlling your blood sugar, mm -hmm. right? But this is the point where I know the American Diabetic Association is just promoting you eat carbs and you just inject more insulin, right? Um, and so again, here's, you can see where the little conflict came, yeah. but I would say you, you have to, you, you have to listen to what I'm saying here and you're going to get this book and you're going to watch these YouTube videos and the person there's, there's a couple people. One would say, Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Give me, tell me, tell me what I have to do. Yeah. And they come back six months later 40 pounds off of them, off their meds, hugging me, right? Wonderful. But there's also the person who will sit there when I discuss this and I, I say, you can reverse it. Really? What do I got to do? Well, you're going to not eat pasta or bread anymore. And you really should not have wine anymore. And oh, whoa, 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 doc. Wait right there. I can't do that. I'm Italian. I'm Italian. I was about to say it. It's got to be the Italian. I'm Italian. Yeah. You would have thought I told them that they had to chop their right arm off to reverse yeah. their diabetes. And they, but you know what? There's a lot of people that they want the pill for the ill. Give me the pill. Nope. Yeah. This is, always gets me. They'd say, you know what, doc? I'm okay. My doctor's really happy with my A1C. You know, all, but all you got to do is up your insulin, but it's still damaging your body and it's still going to cause a miserable end of life. I mean, I've seen it way too many times ending up on dialysis. They have um, neuropathy in their feet. They get toes amputated. They go yeah. blind. This is miserable stuff. Why are people so adamant that it can't possibly be my chocolate and my pasta and my my bread and my ice cream. They just I'm, I'm, I'm born and raised in New Orleans. Like you're speaking my language, you know, with people, with friends, clients of my own, where I'm like, hey, maybe you should try lessening or fully omitting from these. Oh, I can't give that up, dude. Like that's, that's, that's where we are. That's who we are. That's where we're from. Like I can't, I can't live without my wine. I can't live without my fried oysters. I can't live without the gumbo. I can't can't like you physically can't something is impeding you from in the able right. to the exist word is without that. I won't do that. I don't want won't, to. Do yeah. That. Have some accountability and just tell me you don't want to tell me you're not like, I'll respect you. You say, I'm not going to do it. Like, all right, Roger, that is a free country. God bless you. Yeah. But don't say you can't do it. You know? So how did you, how did you, I guess that's kind of the answer right there. Like clearly you saw a need in your yeah. practice for this and then conflict of interest in office maybe said, mm, probably best I take this outside and do this on my own as opposed to doing it in here. Yeah. Um, I, for a little bit in my own way, managed to get the word to some patients who were truly in need. And, but then at that point, I, I also, it just was, 
we got to part ways and off I went. Luckily now I am at a practice. I work part time and I can do whatever I want and say whatever I want and spend as much time as I want. So it's really wonderful. So there's that, but it, I, I, I really came to the point of, I, I need to try to help people. And I started doing just zoom meetings and it was so really enlightening for people to come in and go, I've never talked about how I hit the rappers before. Mm. And there's other people that did that. And like to actually talk about this and actually understand and learn that you got to stick with carnivore and you have to stick with it a hundred percent because yeah. we don't moderate. There is no such thing as eating half of a cupcake, Jake. I'm sorry. <laughs> or, or the, the pint of ice cream, right? Like it's, it makes me laugh to read the label on the serving label on the back of like, you know, serving size, X amount of ounces or however many grams it is. I'm like, <laughs> quarter, a quarter what's cup. The, yeah. What's the point of the serving size? Like it's a single serve. Duh. It's a single serving. Like, yeah. like what is it's the spoon size is the problem. Like you need, <laughs> I need a bigger spoon, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's been so rewarding for me to be able to turn my passion to try to help people into something where I, I just, am so grateful I'm in the position to be able to talk about my experience and help people out of that same hell hole I was in. And yeah, now I am just, I, I have also been donned the queen of meetups because I'm really passionate about hosting a meetup and I'm doing one in Austin during KetoCon at Ironworks Barbecue on the Saturday night of of the uh, conference, but I host one every year. Last year it sold out at 125 people. I had out in the woods in this beautiful Amazing. park. I had a rancher come down from Rhode Island and bring regenerative meat and a chef. And it's so empowering to be around people that get it and who are seeking health and have the same mindset of, I, I say we have an epiphany addiction. That's where I say mm. you cross addict off of all that junk food and you're just hungry for more knowledge and hungry yeah. for the truth. And, you know, it, it's, you know, then it goes into, um, politics and the pandemic and the whole thing of like, well, what really is the truth and what yeah. other things are we not being told and trying to be brainwashed. I mean, I don't put my TV on. I just, it's yeah. a big brainwash <laughs> box, you know, it's like, yeah. what's the point? Um, but yeah, I, I, between my, my coaching groups now that I just, I, I love, I meet with people five or six days a week. People are like, you're crazy. You yeah. do that. I'm like, yeah, I do. Because, you know, I'm dealing with addicts here, Jake, yeah. <laughs> these people need a meeting. They need to really be connected. And really I say community is the opposite of addiction and support is so important. And I learned that even more so when I spoke with Vera Tarman and Bitten Johnson, who are experts at this, that it is critically important to be in your tribe. And, you know, as humans, we want connection. We want to feel we belong. We don't want to feel like people are rolling their eyes at us all the time. I get that. People say, are you still doing that meat eating thing? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I am actually. Are you still out of shape better. and worse off than when, when I started doing it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, should you have listened to me a long time ago? I'm yeah. rolling my eyes now. Yeah. Hey, it's a free country. Do what you want. But like, here I am rolling my eyes the same, you know? Yeah. yeah. Or they're like, well, it might be fine now, but what's your cholesterol? And you're going to have a heart attack. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> you're so interested in that about me now. But when I was eating ice cream and donuts and cookies, Nobody and you didn't give a crap about what I put nope. in my mouth. But now nope. all of a sudden I'm eating what man for hundreds of thousands of years have been eating. And now you're worried about me. I'll Don't tell be. you a funny story about that, especially because of your optometry background. When I had LASIK done in 2012 or 13, my dry eye uh, inability to produce tears was, was really profound and we couldn't figure out why. 
and I was taking the tear, using the teardrops super often, so often, so often, so often. And my doctor couldn't, she's like, this is crazy. Like you're something, something's not right here. And she asked me a lot of different questions. And then finally one day she's like, I need to ask you something very personal. And I need you to be very honest with me because your vision kind of depends on it. And it's not going to improve if we don't get to the root cause of this. I was like, okay, like, well, where's this going? You know? And she's like, do you use any recreational drugs? I was like, oh, well, it's like, that's where this is going. Okay. And I was like, uh, sure. Sometimes. And she's like, do you ingest cocaine? Yes. Uh, how regularly? Pretty regularly. Um, you know, more than X amount per day, more than X amount per week. Sure. She's like, you need to stop doing that right now. I was like, what? She's like, you're, I don't have the terminology, so I'm going to butcher the diagnosis, but basically was saying that something that what I was doing in my septum was getting into my sinus cavity or my tear ducts and somehow drying them out because these either some type of inflammation from the blood vessels in my nose rupturing. Um, but somehow that was linked because everything else that she tried to understand couldn't find a reason for it. And it ended up being that. And so I stopped uh, using as much. I didn't stop completely at the time, but I stopped a little bit just to test the theory. And sure enough, <laughs> I started to have tears. Like, and I was how like, badly do your eyes hurt? I was like, holy shit. I was like, oh my God. But then I go run and tell my friends, my like, guys, I've been doing so much blow that like my tear ducts actually got messed up and, and I got an applause for it. Right? Like, you know, dude, what a bad, like, oh man, you're such a stud. Like you, you, you really throw down. But when I started eating meat, the critics and the naysayers and the people from the cheap seats of just, dude, you got to stop. What are you doing? Like, man, you guys were patting me on the back when I had dry tear ducts from how much blow I was doing. But now I do this. And because Especially when attacking, it's raw meat. <laughs> yeah. And I'm now because I'm attacking your fiber, your, the identities, your identities, the fiber of your identities, like you feel insulted, you feel threatened. And now you're concerned about me? Like. I had uh, another guest a few weeks ago talking about how she never received so much criticism in life than until she adopted this diet. Same. Agreed. As a Marine, as an addict, as a vegan even uh, in the past, like never did I have so much concern or so much criticism or outlash from people until I did this. And now I'm like, well, clearly something's got to be something's got to be right if I'm striking this kind of a nerve, you know? Yeah. Like, you're like, this is really good. <laughs> yeah. Well, for yeah, sure, I, I dare I say we're going to be at that meetup in, in Austin with you at Ironworks. And I think we got another trip coming up in, uh, in August to Wyoming, yeah? Yes. Stoked about that, yes. too. I, that reminds me, I have to get my, uh, my tickets. Um, the one other thing I was going to ask, and do you, what's, your, um, what's your take on caffeine and coffee? Oh, I haven't touched it in a long time. Uh, number one. Number two, and, and again, this is a kid that born and raised in New Orleans. My mother's from Mexico, so like coffee is a staple item in my cultures, all of them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when I got off of coffee, actually, I should say this. My first 30 days of trying Carnival, this is four years ago, almost to the month, um, when, I, when I first started. It was Jan June 2020 during the lockdown. I did my first 30 days and went full on with it. No caffeine no coffee, no extras. It was just animals and animal byproducts. And I still made coffee for my mother every day during that because of the habit of doing it. I still, and I'm a, I was a French presser, so I was very artisanal and particular and, you know, yeah. precise and, and appreciated what I was doing. I made her coffee every single day. Didn't touch it, didn't have it, but smelled it, brewed it, everything. Since then, every time I have it, I just get over, I get too jittery. Um, it disrupts the feeling that I have of, of what I like to say, just strong placidity, like where you just feel zen. Like zen. zen, you're smooth and lucid. Right. And then I just feel too wired and people are like, well, that's good. I'm like, no, you don't understand when you feel this good. You don't, I don't want to disrupt it at all. I don't care if it's an improve. I don't care if it's a stimulant. I don't care if it's going to make me more tranquil or docile or this and that like ashwagandha lines. I don't care. Like, this is so good. It's such a pure state of good feeling and consciousness. I don't want to disrupt it. So then I do that, or if I would do that and it would disrupt it inevitably, I'm like, dude, fuck this. This is not what I want to do. I don't want to feel this way. And that was in New York. 
um, you know, walking around and then realizing like, this is all an accessory. Everybody's got their cups to show that they're working people, that they're part of the food supply. They're part of the ant farm. They're part of the, the populace of, of worker bees, you know? And you think about all the coffee shops in the world, like what if those were actually not good for us? Look at how, how surrounded we are by them. Uh, right. On and then you think corner. about on every corner, you know, like I could stand anywhere and be like, I'm in the middle of nowhere. I'm in Marfa, Texas, and there's coffee shops all over the place. Damn. Like I can't escape that. So what if, you know, it was just another one of those eureka moments of abstaining and then realizing what I was able to derive in the forms of energy and just overall good feeling from nothing but, you know, some steak and eggs. How is that possible? It just made me have to rethink everything I thought I knew. This is, it's very much a matrix experience. This diet has been much more of a matrix experience than I've thought it was going to be at all. I'd Welcome to the matrix, Jake. Totally, total <laughs> unplugging, total questioning of everything. Like you said, authority, big brother and sister, and then government and life. Um, but yeah, I mean, as hard as alcohol was for me to get rid of and, and drugs, I'd say for anybody, like, you want to, you want some real challenges? Stop drinking coffee, stop chewing gum and diet Coke. That's another thing oh, for people. Total it's poison, total gum, poison. diet Coke and coffee. And you know, coffee is so normalized, but it's a psychoactive drug. Yep. It is, um, something that, um, it's also a pesticide and it's not a health food. And why are we bathing our microbiome in that liquid? It's a burnt seed crushed with boiling water poured over it, right? And why are we thinking for a split second that that is normal to this entity, a, a human, a body, that we should be doing that? And people, well, everybody does it. It's so normalized. Yep. And that is one of the things people get so defensive over. And I, I kind of just uh, give a little thought to myself, like, all right, is it my job to try to convince them otherwise? No. Um, you know what? You really have to look into this. There's, there's books written, written on it. Uh, the people out in this influencer space that talk about the benefits of coffee are themselves addicted to it and are not going to, I say, give up the bean. <laughs> And I, you know, there's a great book, Alan Carr. Um, he originally started out with the quit smoking, um, but he's Alan Carr's easy way to quit caffeine. It's an amazing audio book. It's 90 minutes. And I've had a few different people throw their coffee pot out after listening to it and haven't touched <laughs> it again. So it's a pretty impactful uh, um, right thing to listen to. And yeah, I just, I tell people, it's like, you know what? Dry eye? You got dry eye? Give up the coffee. Oh, no, 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 no. Aren't there some drops for that? <laughs> uh, it's tough. It's true. Uh, it, it's, it's the truth. And, and when you can, and for me especially, like when coaching people with discipline and mindset, leadership, self, personal growth development, like self-reliance, these are great little tools to use as hurdles to get to those places. It, because if you can master, yes, if you can master your diet, you can do anything in your life. If you can control your diet, you can control your life. You know, anybody, 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 anybody. Life is uncertain. Work is uncertain. Your careers, your, your kids, relationships, interpersonal, professional, romantic, or otherwise. There's a lot of uncertainty there. As much as you think you have control over those things, and you do have a lot of control, influence, and affluence. Yes, but the thing you absolutely have the most direct control over is always going to be your mind and the body it houses always. So if you want those externals to improve or to be better, go in here and conquer these things first. And like, I would say God. your mouth, every single thing you choose to put through it, you're making a choice is what I'm about to put in my mouth going to lead to health or harm. This is, this is literally my thesis. Um, Lisa, I, I just got accepted to uh, the University of Texas Master of Nutritional Science program um, this week uh, that I'm starting right. in August. And my thesis at UT is the single most effective thing we can do as human beings in regard to our health is, control, is controlling what we put into our mouths. 
period, full stop, bolded, underlined, and italicized. Yeah. I'm, and that's yeah, what I and just wrote all my gonna, statement of purpose to there. Yeah. You're going to have to include in that the, the addiction part of it, because people feel very out of control and out of body experience when they get their car keys, get in the car to go drive and get their DOC, their drug of oh, choice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Even though they know better, even though they know it's going to lead to eventual harm, that's the, that's a really tough thing. But yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll look forward to uh, see how your 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 thesis goes. Well, I'm stoked. I'm stoked. So where do you know where do we find you online? Where do we connect with you and and otherwise? Um, yeah, I guess if you, I'll give you the the links. Uh, I my YouTube channel is Carnivore Doctor. My Instagram is carnivore doctor and carnivore-doctor.com is a website that I have. And um, yeah, that's probably the best way to, and eventually I'm gonna write a book, but I haven't awesome. found the time yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean serving all these people? You don't have free time to write a whole book about it? Come yeah, on. not yet, not yet, not yet. It's been great I, having you today. Um, yeah, I look forward to seeing you next week in Austin. I'm stoked. I'm stoked and hitting up Ironworks for sure. You can count my, my mother and I, my mother will be there with me. So you can count Excellent. for that for sure. She's also three years into this uh, experience herself and hasn't looked back and is feeling wow. better. Wow. I, yeah. I, so yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll talk to you in Austin about my, no doubt. my woes and my, with my, my own mom, just, you know, uh, you know, but it makes me it's realize tough. How, the toughest how, with family. Yeah, it is. You want the best for them, but they have to want it for themselves. Absolutely. Bottom Absolutely. Line. All right. Thank you so much for having you me. Bet. Thanks for being here, Lisa. And for everybody else, we'll have Lisa's uh, contact information, Dr. Lisa Wiedemann, the carnivore doctor. You'll find her at, at carnivore doctor on Instagram, uh, carnivore doctor on YouTube. And again, like Lisa said, carnivore-doctor.com for her website. Check her out, read about her, sign up for her coaching programs and connect with her there. But for everybody else, uh, I'm Jake Thomas. Thanks again for tuning in for another episode of Sick, Scared, and Stupid. We'll see you next time. Cool.